Good evening, this is Ed Hamler with your World in Review. Anyone who thinks that we're not on the verge of a world war and mass genocide is in either denial or bumped his head up against Obama while shamelessly trying to kiss his butt. There's a current drumbeat playing out right now as a kind of war-themed soap opera with all the characters playing the role they're supposed to play. The warmongers are playing themselves, the anti-war mongers are now coming into play saying we should have peace with Iran for example and in the case of Ron Paul openly calling Obama a dictator but not impeaching him for actually being one is another case. After all Mr. Paul and all the other members of Congress have to worry about the elections first. Now behind all these theatrics lies a real danger which goes well beyond something that now looks like a repeat of the Iraq war but it's really not. We're talking about global genocide. That is what's going on and nothing else. The stated policy of the British monetary empire has always been to kill off as many people as possible so that the population never gets above the controllable amount of people that is one billion people. We now have seven billion people so the culling process has begun in the middle of the breakdown of the transatlantic system. The only way that this could even be accomplished, this mass genocide, is for the United States, Russia, and China to engage in a world war which now threatens the populations of the entire planet. That is the expressed intention and what's going on in the Middle East, for example, and a potential war with Iran is not the issue. That is only a precursor to a much larger intention for global genocide, a reduction of the population by billions. That is the issue. The only solution, therefore, is not to play the theatrical game of who's going to attack whom and when or something like that. The only policy solution must be first to remove Barack Obama from office, as he has been employed by the British to be a key tool in this mass extinction agenda. And secondly, we must move now for a willful unified commitment to increase the global population by trillions in fact, based on the development of national economies around technological progress. We actually don't have enough people. As was reported earlier today by Natalie Lovgren, recently we've observed a number of phenomena occurring in our solar system from dangerous solar flares, emerging sunspot regions, to coronal mass ejections, to asteroids flirting with Earth's orbit. All these phenomena occur in a highly active cosmic period in our galaxy, one that demands something more from mankind than just observation. Because for all intents and purposes, that method does not guarantee actual knowledge or actual survival. We need to get out there and find out what's going on. Well, it's good that we're starting to be able to detect these things. This just doesn't cut it. We need to not only be observing these phenomena, but controlling them and harnessing their energy. We could be mining these asteroids and altering the course of their orbits instead of just taking pictures of them and hoping they don't make a surprise landing somewhere near home. Imagine not only being able to steer a rocket-powered aircraft carrier sized chunk of iron and nickel somewhere out of harm's way but then being able to mine it. And once we get a radio telescope array into Mars orbit and effectively make a telescope with the aperture as large as the distance between the orbits of Earth and Mars then we'll begin to have some of the requisite precision to detect more of what's going on in our neighborhood. Furthermore, we must discover and begin to measure new parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we never before knew existed. We can't build instruments to observe things that yet exist in domains unknown to us. We're also going to have to set up colonies on the moon and Mars to sustain human populations and support a deeper investigation of our solar system. So we're going to have to increase our human population to make sure that we have enough creative custodians to tend to its progress. In order for us to achieve this, it will require a dramatic shift in military and other policies now. 
away from the British population extinction policy at play right now, which is called World War, to a utilization of the military to the effective increase of energy flux density technologies to sustain and develop higher rates of uh, populations on our planet and beyond. Lyndon LaRouche weighed in recently on this issue saying, we've reached a period where normal warfare will not function any longer. We have to shift to an approach of giving people what they lack. We have to compel them to adapt by demonstrating the potential of where they should be. In order to accomplish this, the military function must transform itself to a space function. It has to ask, how do we protect mankind? We have to look at the threats of nearby space. Consider this recent asteroid passing us. It's not a threat, but it underscores the fact that in the future there will be such threats. This is what the Russians are discussing with their SDE. We need a new military with a can-do-all capability, an enhanced engineering approach. Can we put a temporary station on Mars? Well, all the indications are that that is the expressed intent by the nations in the Pacific, uh, namely Russia and China, for example. Now, the British Empire will not let this progress that they're having in the Pacific go unchallenged, not without the threat of nuclear warfare. But if we can take the proper steps now, we can outpace and leave that empire in the dustbin of history while we move on to take our place as masters of this universe and the orientation in the Pacific region is charting out the pathway. The international community has just completed the first mission to Mars and the six-man crew has safely returned to Earth. That assertion is not far off the mark in the estimation of the many participants in the international project Mars 500, which has just come to its completion. The third stage in a series of isolation experiments held at the Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of Biomedical Problems, Mars 500 was a test run to a Mars voyage, an experiment where a mock crew of astronauts were locked into a mock spacecraft with simulated spaceflight conditions for a period of 500 days, approximating the duration a crew might spend in a mission to Mars and back. Specifically designed to investigate the psychological and medical impacts of the long-term isolation which will accompany future space flight missions. This mission to the Red Planet was kept as accurate as possible with planned simulated landings and other missions and limited communications outside the craft, including a 25-minute time delay with any communications on Earth. The conditions were so real to the participants that during a simulated Mars landing, the pulse rate of the astronauts came in at 160 beats per minute, as compared to Yuri Gagarin's pulse rate when he was in orbit of 157 beats per minute. Now, despite many predictions to the contrary, the entire crew lasted voluntarily throughout the entire 500 days. The six-man crew included a 27-year-old Italian-Colombian engineer, a 27-year-old Chinese instructor at the China Astronaut Research and Training Center, a 31-year-old French engineer, and three Russians, a surgeon, a physiologist, and engineer Alexei Sergeyevich Sitev, who is the commander of the mission. This crew has now become an unlikely team which has participated in the giant leaps mankind as a whole will make in our destined mission to Mars and beyond. Since we came back to Earth, um, the, the two main points uh, for me from this experiment are that this mission was a success and, and so we can go forward in our um, plan to go to Mars and, uh, and move confidently. Humans can go there. While Mars 500 never actually left the surface of the Earth, at 1.26 p.m. Pacific time today, Russian space agency Roscosmos launched its first probe to Mars in over 15 years. The Phobos Grunt, Grunt meaning soil in Russian, will orbit Mars, then land on one of its moons, Phobos, 
and after gathering seven ounces of Phobos soil, will launch it in a capsule back to the Earth, so that scientists here can study if it contains any clues about the creation of Mars or its moons. The 15-ton spacecraft also comes with a surprising visitor, the first Chinese satellite to head to Mars. The Chinese satellite will study Mars's surface, atmosphere, magnetic field, and ionosphere. The Russian Phobos Grund is also carrying instruments from France, Finland, Bulgaria, and a space research group, the Planetary Society. If Phobos Grund is successful, Russia has plenty more plans for interplanetary exploration, including missions to asteroids, comets, and moons of the gas giant planets. So with this perspective set to be destroyed along with the majority of the world's population due to a world war created by the British Empire, ask yourself, are you so much of a coward as to not face this threat head on now before us? How long will you vacillate on stopping this genocide while the alternative is actually in place and that we have the chance to act now? Are you willing to still tolerate another day with Barack Obama in office so as to destroy your own life in doing so? Will you allow yourself to become a human sacrifice for Barack Obama? Well, as long as you still tolerate the immorality in yourself that tolerates him, you might as well consider yourself dead on arrival now. While imperial assets and low-grade nuts like Obama and Netanyahu are escalating a war campaign, threatening to detonate the Middle East to effectively trigger a world war against the Eurasian continent, and fabricating a vast sea of lies to achieve this aim, we must ask ourselves, will we be stupid enough to get dragged along in this? Is Obama going to go unchallenged again despite his long list of heinous crimes against humanity, beginning with his assassination of American citizens Anwar al awlaki and his teenage son, his murderous drone campaign over the Middle East and African continent, and his unconstitutional aggressive war in Libya which led to the extrajudicial murder of Muammar Gaddafi. Will we be stupid enough to overlook the criminal insanity of this president? Will we be stupid enough to permit world war? Because if we are, we're probably also too stupid to deserve our own continued existence, as the allowance of nuclear world war will soon make very evident. Unfortunately for us, it is that quality of too stupid for our own good that the British monetary empire has capitalized on for much of modern history. It is the only way a population of people can be cold and capped. Because if indeed we weren't under the thumb of the oligarchy most of the time, we'll quickly realize that not only has world war always been a strategy of British depopulation, but we'll also come to acknowledge the fact that we're actually significantly underpopulated to effectively deal with a truly inevitable war. One with the forces of nature and everything else that is being hurled at us from outside our little planet Earth. On top of a recent string of anomalous record-breaking earthquakes in unlikely places, like the cluster of strong earthquakes which hit Oklahoma this weekend, Earth is currently looking square in the face of the largest sunspot group since 2005, 17 times the size of our little planet. We would certainly be lucky if this solar plasma emitting sunspot group passes on by quietly, but what if it doesn't? What if it decides to belch out several billion tons of gas straight at Earth, which is likely to occur over the next five days or so? Would we be prepared to deal with that? Or how about the near-miss asteroid that flew right between us and our moon yesterday afternoon? Certainly there have been numerous cases when an asteroid almost hit us. But again, are we prepared for the inevitable? <laughs>